Welcome. My name is Jana Martin, and I'm CEO of the American Insurance Trust, known to most of you as the Trust. Thank you for joining us today for the last part of our two-part series on marketing. This webinar is the result of the work of the Trust SPTA Advisory Council. Let me tell you a little bit about this wonderful group. The Trust has long been a supporter of state associations. We believe that by supporting you, we support our policyholders and that our partnership allows for the most benefit for all of us. As many of you know, we instituted the Trust SPTA endorsement program many years ago, and we're proud to say we're endorsed by 48 SPTAs. We're always considering new ways the Trust can be a useful resource for you and for your members, and in late 2018, we created the Trust SPTA Advisory Council. The focus of this council has been to brainstorm ways to enhance the mutually beneficial relationship of the Trust and SPTAs organizationally and financially. The current Advisory Council consists of the following SPTA Executive Directors. Dr. Ray Folan, Hawaii, Ms. Amy Wilson, Mississippi, Ms. Carmen Scar, Nebraska, Mr. Michael Ranney, Ohio, and Ms. Martha Turner Quest, North Carolina. I'm privileged to meet monthly with these fine and fun members who represent small, medium, and large associations from various regions and who have a good mix of experience. I hope you were able to join us for our informative webinar on directors and officers insurance in mid-February and the first part of this marketing series in early March. Also, if you have ideas for future topics or on ways we can continue to support you, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Now I'd like to tell you about our knowledgeable presenter, Marvo Regendon. Marvo is the executive director of the Washington State and the Alaska Psychological Associations, as well as the president and owner of Thinking Cap, a marketing and association management company virtually based in Spokane, Washington. Marvo began his career as a graphic designer in the advertising and marketing industry. In 1999, he put his marketing communications degree to work and started his company which provides graphic design and marketing services to local and regional clients in Washington State, California, and Washington, D.C. His company has won many awards over the years based on design and marketing outcomes. He also has been in volunteer leadership positions for several nonprofits, including KSPS Public Television, and he is currently the board vice president of AHANA, Multi-Ethnic Business Association. We're very fortunate to have him take the time to be with us today and share his expertise with us. Marvo, we so appreciate your being here, taking time out to be with us and preparing. You did such a great job in the first part. We know this one will be good too. Thank you so much. And I'll join you back at the end when it's Q&A time. Well, thank you, Jana, and thank you for the trust for asking me to do these presentations. Um, and uh, for those of you out there that are uh, my colleagues as, as executive directors, hello and good morning from Spokane, Washington, or good afternoon, wherever you're at, um, and we'll get started. So uh, next slide, please. So today, I will cover um, how often to send uh, marketing emails, uh, what is SEO and how to grow it, how often to post on social media, and social media platforms to use. Next slide, please. You've got mail. I don't know how many of you um, remember when email was that novel thing and it was AOL, and you just waited to hear those words, you've got mail. I think now a lot of us uh, as uh, executives almost dread to <laughs> open up our emails. Um, I don't know if, it's, if you are like me, but just too many emails seem to come through and I spend a lot of my day 
ciphering through uh, trying to figure out what to read because there's so much of that, so much of it that's out there. Next slide, please. And there's so much of it out there because there are a lot of people vying for your attention. And so the question of sending out marketing emails or emails in question, uh, in emails in general always comes up in the way of a question. Uh, so that frequency of marketing emails um, really depends on your audience. And you know we kind of discussed that uh, in the last presentation, knowing who you're speaking to, um, but it, it really, it really depends on that to, to, because there are no really hard set rules when it comes to the frequency of marketing emails. Um, if you were a, if you are a store or a grocery store or something like that, that has promotions every day and you have a strong following, they find that, that their, their following wants to see an email practically every day, even twice a day. They, if they're really popular and they've got great things that are available. Others, on the other hand, will find that their um, followers really only want to see emails from them two or three times a week, sometimes once a week. So again, it really depends on who your market is. Next slide, please. So what is that frequency? Studies have shown that Tuesdays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. are ideal times to send an email. And that's mostly, mostly because um, there's so much email nowadays that they get lost on Mondays. People are just coming back from the weekend. And so unless they're looking for something specific, uh, Mondays aren't gonna be great. By the time Monday is over and Tuesday comes along, all right, around two, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., people have really started to settle into their week and they're gonna be a lot more receptive to your email on that day. Now, now that's not to say that you can't send an email on Monday, you can, um, but just know that it'll be lost. I would think that if you were gonna send something on Monday, send it more towards the end of the day and not at the beginning of the day, because if you can imagine the amount of of email that you get, amount of spam that you may be getting when you first log in and look at your email and you spend an hour, the first hour of your day, just ciphering through, deleting, you know, moving emails to different folders, you get the idea. So towards the end of the day on Monday, they'll be more receptive, but definitely on Tuesday becomes that first best time. Next slide, please. So fortunate for us, we have a captured market. We know who we're talking to. We know who our audience is. We know that they're psychologists. And because of that, we know that there are certain habits for clinical psychologists, which is gonna be the bulk of, of our membership and, and who we are sending emails to. Um, I know with, with my state associations, most of them have a nine o'clock client uh, to start with. Um, so they could be checking emails between 7.30 and 8.45. They will take a lunch break, usually between noon and one, maybe it's noon and two, who, who knows, um, but they will be checking emails then. And they also check emails after hours, after 5 p.m. And then we know that Fridays are paperwork days for most of them. So Fridays would also be a good day to send out an email to our, our members, our SPTA members. But again, there's that thought that Tuesday between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. will be the ideal uh, time, but, but maybe it's not for your particular organization. Next, next slide, please. So in order to really figure out what that ideal time is, day and time, it's, you just need to do some testing, testing to find your sweet spot. So if you have a regular email that you send out on a weekly basis, whether it's a CE blast or an info blast or, or something, and even if it's not every week, maybe if it's, if it's every other week, try sending those emails on different days of the week and then look at your results. Now, hopefully you're using an email platform 
that provides you open rates and click-through data rates, CTRs. So those will allow you to examine and determine how well certain days are reacting when you send out an email. Um, and again, those open rates are are, are going to be ideal. In a general email, if you're just sending a blast out to, you know, a, a large list, not a captured audience, I would think that, um, not I would think, it, it's been shown, the studies show that an open rate of about 5% is going to be ideal. Um, but again, you know, we're, we've got a captured market uh, with Washington. Uh, when we send out an email, our open rates are 35 plus, uh, and that's pretty good. I'd, I'd really like it to be higher, um, but you know, the 35 plus is, is, is pretty good when you consider that your active um, membership is probably at that 25 to 35 percent. Um, memberships that have a higher active membership um, and are getting a lower open rate, then you need to examine when you're sending out those emails and see if a different day and time starts to affect that open rate. That click-through rate is when you have um, a, a link within your email. Let's say that you are informing your members that there is a webinar that's coming up and click here to register. That's what you want to see, um, how many people are clicking that link to go to that particular page. So a high click-through rate is going to be ideal if you're hoping for good registration, uh, good donations, and things like that. Next slide, please. Another consideration is the email platforms that you use. Um, with Washington, we actually use two platforms. We have Constant Contact, and the other type is MailChimp that's out there. Uh, we use those because we also send to non-members, and um, we've just got this list that, we, that has been growing over the years. And um, so with Constant Contact and MailChimp, um, that's specific to outside of the membership. Uh, our members will be included into those. But the nice thing about those platforms is that they allow for a more designed look, more appealing look. The one um, aspect about those particular uh, platforms is that they don't allow for attachments. So if you wanted to have an attachment, a PDF, or something like that that you wanted to attach with uh, an email, that won't be possible through those. So what you need to do is you need to put that PDF on a website and then put a link for them to go to it to do a download. The other email that we use is on the back end of our CRM. And then that is specifically to members. And um, that's where we see the highest um, open rates is when we send emails through our CRM um, at that 35%. I think with our email platform through constant contact when we do send because it's a much larger um, list that we have out there and they are to non-members. We're a little bit above average at about a 10% open rate when we send out that way. But our CRM, by, by using a, um, a CRM that has a email platform to it, um, we also have uh, our message board and LS serve on there. And then we also have specific groups and um, so we're finding that our members are really starting to use uh, and, and participate within the CRM emails. And we really just kind of um, use our constant contact to that, for that general. Next slide, please. So a few conclusions <clears throat> about emails. There is um, the, the, the studies that show that Tuesdays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. are ideal is the ideal uh, day to send out an email. Um, use some testing, test to see where you can find your sweet spot. Um, look, for, <coughs> excuse me, um, look for your open rates and your click-through rates. 
to make sure that either messaging or our offers are, are getting the most out of that. And then also survey your members. Survey your members to find out when's an ideal time to send out emails that they, you know, that they would like to receive, but also survey them to find out how many emails they prefer to get from your association. That's always good information to know. All right, so let's go on to search engine optimization. Next slide, please. So SEO, search engine optimization, um, a very, very interesting topic. Um, you all, the word Google has become a verb nowadays. Uh, and that, you know, that's basically because you're doing some search, but there are other platforms out there besides Google. There's Yahoo and Bing. Um, and then in different countries, they use, they, they also have their own. So uh, Yandex is, is the top one in Russia and Baide, Baidu is the one, is the top one in China. But they all have one thing in common, and that is that you are typing in uh, a search question to try and find uh, a website that you're looking for. And let's go to the next slide, please. So SEO is the process of optimizing your online content so that a search engine shows at the top result or first page for searches of a certain keyword. So think about it. there's three there's three connections there. Um, there's you, there's the search engine, and then there's the searcher, right? So you, if you are typing in, uh, trying to find in, trying to find your um, SPTA website, you need to understand how people are pro are probably trying to search for you. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit later, but are they searching for you um, the way you think they are, all right? Um, there's also another type of SEO and that's SEO marketing. And let's go to the next slide on that. So SEO marketing is primarily for those um, businesses that have um, a store or something to offer. And so SEO marketing, um, is a way to increase the quality and the quantity of website traffic. So really what they're looking to do is bring in more qualified buyers to the website when they do a search. Um, does that relate to SPTAs? Perhaps, but not quite the same. So if, I, if we could go back one to the regular SEO slide, I just wanna talk a little bit about the search. So again, the key word is the search and you need to know how people are searching for your website. Are they searching by typing in your SPTA acronym or are they searching by typing in a word? Um, that plays a big difference in, in the way of your website link coming up at the top of the page or even on the first page. Uh, primarily, the best way to get best searches or, or top of page is when someone types in words versus acronyms because so many other organizations are using acronyms that are similar to you. So if you were typing in, I'll, I'll give the example of WSPA for Washington State. Uh, if you typed in Washington, uh, WSPA, you're not going to find the State Psychological Association at the top of the page. You're going to get um, a Petroleum Association because they're much bigger and they've, they've been around longer. I don't know if they've been around longer, but they've got more, more searches for them. So, so if you typed in WSPA, they're going to come up first. But if you typed in Washington State or Washington and Psychology, then those two words uh, will search your websites, either the, the top of your browser, the, the slugs at the very, very top, or the content within your pages. So words within your pages are going to be ideal and key for when we have search information. So let's go back down to uh, the SEO marketing slide, and then let's go to the next slide, please, the organic SEO tools. Thank you. 
All right, so what I was just talking about was keywords. So you just need to make sure that you, you kind of understand how people are searching for your website. Um, hopefully they're gonna be typing in psychology. They're gonna be typing in maybe the, the name of the state um, and, and some other words that pertain to psychology. And as long as the content within your pages have that, then you start your, your website link will start to come up at the top of the page versus if you just typed in your state acronym. Backlinks to other websites that have a lot of traffic are another, another way to in, increase your SEO because that back and forth then starts to link back to your website. And then having keywords within your domain also helps the search engines. So we have to think about, in a way, um, if you were looking at doing um, a naming convention of words, um, by having words within your domain name are better than having an acronym, but we know that's not always possible. So next slide, please. And I'll get, I'll get into that in, in, in the slide after this. Um, so how important is SEOs to SPTAs? The first question is, is there competition for you in the state? If there is, then you'll have to do a little bit harder work to get your SEO to go above your competition. And then as I mentioned, does your URL or your website domain use an acronym versus words? So URLs with words have higher SEOs than acronyms. And the example that I'm gonna show is that there's only one Washington, Washington State Psychological Association, but WSPA.org is taken by the Western States Petroleum Association. Next slide, please. So here's an example of what I'm talking about at the very, very top where you have your search. Um, by adding words into that search in the about us area uh, would be helpful, but that, you know, that takes a lot of effort um, and, and work within putting that in. So if that read WS, wspasite.org, uh, and then before about, it'd be w, wspasite.org, Washington-State-Psychologicalassociation.about.php or wspasych.org backslash wspa.about.php. So inserting either that acronym or the words before that page will help increase that SEO, but that's a lot of work. Uh, and so that's, that's one way to do it organically. Um, but it is a lot of work to do that. So you need to understand what is, what do you really want out of your SEO? Is it that you want to have people, uh, when they type in your, your acronym, that it comes to the top of the page? If that's the case, then one way that you can do it is by having all your pages at the top, rename them to have your acronym right after that first backslash. Um, but again, it, take, it takes a lot of work. You can pay people to do that. And that's sometimes what search engine optimization groups will do. They will charge a lot to be able to find different ways to make that, that search come up real quickly. But I, I talked about that naming convention. So with Washington State, the, they had an acronym that was WAPSYCH.org. And then when I um, started working with them, I started to hear from members saying, I tried to find your website and why isn't WSPA part of your, your URL? Well, we found out that WSPA was taken by the Petroleum Association, the Western States Petroleum Association. And so we looked at a couple different variations. And I believe that we did suggest at one point WSPA-psych.org um, and then without a dash, and we weren't that SEO savvy back then. Um, and so the board decided, nah, the dash is a little too much. They didn't like the way it looked. It wasn't, um, they just didn't like the way it looked. They didn't want to have that e extra character in there. But in hindsight, it would have been better to have that in there 
for better SEO, because if you think about a naming convention where you have WSPA, then WSPA dash or WSPA dot, those, those URLs will come up higher on a page before WSPA site.org. Okay, so conclusions about SEOs. Um, use organic keywords and backlinks to help grow your SEO and keep your website relevant to searches. And unless you have competition, you will need to live or be, be good with knowing that you will have to have a, a, a lower ranking if um, competing against a similar URL with a higher ranking. Next slide, please. All right, social media. And I'm sure that you can recognize several of those icons there. Next slide, please. So I did a little bit of research to find out what the demographics look like for uh, the basic social media that I, I believe that SPTAs would use. Um, and as you can see with this particular chart that um, the, the primary age ranges that are there uh, on Facebook and Instagram are actually fairly similar. I was actually surprised about that. I really thought that Facebook had a higher demographic um, and the more search that I did, it does show that, that, um, that the older demographic age for Facebook is starting to grow. Uh, but primarily, they're still showing that the primary ages are 25 to 34. And then Instagram uh, is also a media platform that is starting to, to um, gain a lot of popularity uh, with the younger uh, age range. And to me, that age range is really going to be that 18 to 30 ish age range. And again, there's Twitter. Um, I'm not an active Twitter content producer. I'm an active Twitter consumer. Um, but that has a, a larger age range or an older age, age range, I should say. And then there's LinkedIn. So again, the reason why I'm bringing up these ages and then you can also see the breakdown between male and female is that this is again understanding your audience when you want to start using social media as a platform to get out your messages. Um, next slide please. So let's just take a quick look at Facebook. Uh, it's still currently used um, as the most engaged platform that is out there. Um, as much as you may hear that the younger crowd is abandoning Facebook, they are not. They're just not using it as much. Is that abandoning? Maybe to a bit, but they are still there. Um, with SPTAs, um, how many posts should you have? It all depends. Um, depends on that content. Uh, post two to three times a week if you can find good content to share. When posting an article, it's best to also pull out some information from that content that grabs some attention. So generally what I like to do is if I see an article uh, regarding psychology and maybe the, the headline doesn't quite say too much of it, I will go down into that article and then I'll find a, a, a bit of that article that says, um, Dr. So-and-so said that studies showed this, so a little bit of a nugget so that our SPTA audience would go, oh, that sounds really interesting. I'm gonna click on that and, and read it. Um, that's much better than just sharing an article where you know, your audience is just gonna go, hmm, okay, maybe I'll, I'll not look at it and maybe I will. The other thing about Facebook is that they have uh, private Facebook groups and that's another way to get members involved and to interact on that platform. Next slide. So this just shows you uh, a chart of you know, what that demographic looks like, that 25 to 34 is really that highest part. And then um, the 45 on up lower, but I do believe that that's gaining a lot more uh, as we, as, as we uh, get more into social media. Next slide, please. Okay, Instagram. So Instagram um, is 
a platform that is primarily sharing photos and now videos. So it's primarily visual with a little bit of action words to it. So it's a little, it's a lot more different than than Facebook, uh, where you're more apt to give give your opinion or state something and people have to read it. This is more visual in that aspect of it. It's got a very steady growth. It's the second largest platform, and most likely the reason why is because it's part of Facebook. From a marketing point of view, the nice part of that is it's got the same advertising type platform to it. And so if you're looking to do some marketing, promoting your events and things like that, uh, you won't have to try and figure out what's the difference between Facebook and um, Instagram. There is a video platform out there which, uh, with a much younger audience called TikTok. I'm sure that everybody has heard about that. And because of that video platform, Instagram, which was primarily just videos, has started to introduce uh, a video aspect of their, their platform to, to capture those age ranges that start to gravitate a little um, older and, and then move into Instagram. Um, with WSPA, uh, our uh, early career and social justice groups um, have informed me that they wanna start using Instagram. I'm not a, an Instagram user, and so I'm really curious to find out how they start to use that. Next slide, please. And this just gives you a chart to show you how Instagram has really become popular in the last couple of years. Okay, next slide. So Twitter. Um, I was not a big Twitter user at first. Uh, and it was primarily because I didn't feel like there was anything that I wanted to push out that that was interesting. So you need to think that there's two aspects of this particular social media. There are content creators and then content absorbers. And so I'm a, a Twitter user as a content absorber. I will follow people and follow organizations to see what they are putting out and digest it that way. So I use it more as a news platform in that aspect, but it's in a very short um, message count. So there are, uh, your messages could only be 280 characters. And so you'll see that there are gonna be Twitter posts that continue on uh, if there's a lot that needs to be said. But um, the nice thing about Twitter is that its base and growth have remained consistent over the past few years. So that's good. It's shown that it's consistent and stable and it's place a good place to, to discuss events and breaking news. Um, as I talked about, there are influencers or content creators and then content absorbers like me, but 10% of the active users are actually putting out 80% of the content that's out there. So you need to be understanding how you want to use Twitter. Again, my uh, there are a couple of groups within Washington State that have asked, do we have a Twitter account? And I said, well, we do, um, but I'm not the right person to be putting out the content. Uh, so they are looking to um, start developing content that they will put out. In fact, I think that there uh, be social justice Group, uh, group uh, the Good Trouble group with Washington State is the one that wants to start put releasing and putting out content on on Twitter. So I'll, I'll be real interested interested to see how that that starts to work out. The interesting thing about Twitter, though, is that it's a uh, the the consumers of Twitter uh, are highly are highly educated. Forty two percent are um, 42% of Twitter uh, users uh, are degree holders compared to 31% of all Americans. So um, that's a really good aspect of wanting to understand how to use Twitter for an SPTA. Highly educated people. And uh, that seems to be the social media that works best for them. Uh, next slide, please. And then a graphic that shows the, the usage. And as you can see, Q3 of 2020, that um, the Twitter users have the demographics um, 
came down just a little bit from Q2 of 2020, but it's fairly stable over the last couple of years. And next slide. And then there's LinkedIn. So LinkedIn being more of a professional um, platform uh, and in general, it, it does cater to an, old, an older audience, um, but millennials are taking up 25% of that platform. And most likely, uh, and because of, uh, the millennials are looking for jobs and looking to network, uh, that becomes the, the top platform to um, do some job prospecting. prospecting. Again, just like Twitter, a highly educated uh, platform, user on that platform. But interestingly enough, 70% of users are outside of the US. So that presents an opportunity for organizations or companies that are looking to expand beyond the borders. And we'll go to the next slide, please. So this gives you an idea of the Twitter users um, worldwide. And next slide. All right, so some conclusions about social media. Again, it's knowing the platform to use per your message. So think of it as, think of them as tools. Uh, the way I will tell my graphic design students that you know, there are several types of graphic design software out there and think of it as a tool. Uh, for example, um, you can certainly use uh, a screwdriver to pound a nail into some wood, but the right tool would probably be a hammer versus a screwdriver, right? So if you know your social media platforms and the, and the audience that it caters to, uh, that is helpful. Use it as a tool. Uh, social media platforms can be linked together, so all you need to do is do one, one um, post and then it, it will post to all three or four that you want to use. But it does take time um, and if you are an executive director that um, is more in the way of managing your organization um, and not into knowing every aspect of the, cl the clinical practice, uh, you are not going to be the greatest person or the best person to be putting out a lot of the tweets. Uh, you need to get someone that that is more knowledgeable. Uh, and so you either need to find volunteers that will do it from your organization, or if you if your organization doesn't have time to do that, you can hire younger people, you can hire students, but again, you need to feed them the content versus asking them to create the content. Next slide, please. So that's it. There's my presentation on social media. Um, it, it, it can go much larger than this, but I, I'm hoping that what I presented today gave you a better idea of email, SEO, and then the, the other platforms on social media and how that all works. Well, Marvo, you certainly stirred up a lot of questions. So you did a great job. Uh, so let's let's uh, get to some of these questions because I think they'll be beneficial to folks. If we go back to the first part of your presentation when you were talking about sending mass messages primarily through email to members or prospective members, what suggestions do you have so that those emails don't get marked as spam? Well, for your members, you know, you're either going to be, again, they're the different platforms that I talked about, either a constant contact or it's going to be an email that comes from the back end of your, your website, your CRM. If your members are already getting those emails from you, they are not going to be considered spam because you have already been sending them emails. It's gonna be the, the first time the new members that are probably gonna see them as spam. Um, and, you know, the search engines don't necessarily, or the, 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 the back end servers aren't necessarily going to take a look at your, 
email subject line and say, that is spam. People say that they do. There's a little bit of an, uh, uh, a science behind that, but primarily um, if you have been sending out and, and your members have been receiving your emails, they're gonna get every one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also possible you could uh, do a campaign of sorts and say, you know, we send out a lot of really good information. Please make sure that this address that we're using is uh, not blocked uh, uh, for, because otherwise you'll miss hearing good stuff from WSPA. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so here's another question. Is there a reason why you use CRM for your listserv rather than the APA listserv platform? Um, I don't think that I have a good answer to that. Uh, when I started to work with uh, WSPA, they had their own individual listserv. Uh, so I inherited that. Uh, and we actually just migrated from the email server type listserv to the message board, <coughs> excuse me, message board through our CRM. Um, and to, to me, that was a good move. Uh, what I liked about the message board platform on our CRM is that it allows us and members to um, get a daily digest of any posts that go through. Uh, and, and so that was the one big benefit that I started to let members know when we did the switch over was you can click and get a daily digest and then be able to get one email at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. And I'm not sure when it actually sends it out. I don't think that you can say send it at one particular time. time. But it's much easier to get one email and just scan it and go, oh, there's three, four uh, posts on there, but that's the one post that I'm interested in. Then I can go back and read it and reply. Mm -hmm. so. well, there's a follow-up question. What CRM do you all use? We are using MemberLeap. Member? Leap. MemberLeap. Mm -hmm. Leap. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I know that every CRM does not have um, all the bells and whistles. It, it all depends. And it all depends on, on how much you are paying for your CRM. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, how often would you post a promo for a CE event on Facebook? Well, I would make that a event, first of all. And that way, there's two opportunities there. People will either look for events with your organization and do a registration. Um, and then you, you actually capture a lot more information in, in, in a Facebook event platform. And then you can push that out. Oh, you know, I, I generally like to push that out once a week for the first couple of weeks. And then the closer you get to your event, then I start to push it out a little bit more often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, it. That's good guidance in terms of making it an event. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Um, do newsletters have a viable role in marketing and SPTA member communication, or are they a communication dinosaur? Email newsletters, I still believe, have a lot of value. I think that when you poll your members um, about their satisfaction with your organization, if you are not sending out a lot of information, they may say, well, I don't hear too much from leadership. I don't know what my SPTA is doing. I do see that dues renewal email that comes through, um, but I haven't really, I, I have no idea what you guys are doing. So email uh, digests, you know, emails that you send out in the way of a newsletter, uh, I, I, I really feel are very important pieces of communication. Um, whether they read it or not, you can't force that on anybody. But, you know, there is that opportunity for people to find out what particular committees are, are, are working on and what you've been able to achieve and, you know, what you may be doing legislatively. Um, 
because without that, uh, a newsletter, you, you can't go, it's hard to go back and find archived emails about mm -hmm. it, but it's easier right. to find it through, through a newsletter. Right, right. And I know uh, some associations find it helpful to have uh, an article or two that would qualify for an hour of CE. Yes, and, yeah. uh, and so that can pull in additional readers um, uh, to the newsletter that you can kind of sneak in information about what the association is doing uh, while the person yeah. is also doing the, the CE. So right. uh, the, the final question we have, at least at this point, is um, we're interested in a social media policy or procedures for our SPTA that identifies who determines content and has access to post for the SPTA. Do you have any recommendations or thoughts? I'd love to hear some. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that, you know, that's such a timely question. Uh, at our last board meeting, um, the early, not the early career, our social justice uh, committee, uh, Good Trouble Committee is very active. And they, they brought up that, that question. When we make a post, who needs to vet it? Does it need to go to the board? Does it need to go to the ED or the vice, you know, the board president? Who's going to determine to do that? Um, and there was a lot of discussion. Uh, I let the board and the committee members go through their whole discussion. Uh, and then, you know, I I'd actually didn't participate too much in that. But uh, in the back of my mind, my, my feeling was that um, the board members uh, that were in this committee that brought up the, the question uh, are, should be familiar enough with your organization to know what type of post would be appropriate or not. And if it is a post that is gonna bring on a lot of controversy, then yes, bring that by a, you know, bring that by the board for some approval or some some input, but I would think that most posts are going to be safe enough to be able to post without a lot of oversight, mm -hmm. because committee members are there to to work on that particular aspect mm -hmm. of, for example, with social justice, they are seeing what's going on with social justice, and we would see them as our experts in our organization when we. If, if there was a question about, um, you know, the, the current aspect of anti-Asian hate, we would go to them and say, what are you seeing and what do you suggest? What do we want to do? And so we are le leaning on them as the experts as to what mm -hmm. they would suggest. Yeah. We had someone just post uh, what they do. Um, and the person says, ours is only the executive director. The board is too many hands in the pot but I am also solely doing marketing for our SPTA. So I have a better understanding of what to post and what not to post. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, one other thing I will mention, and then I'll ask you for some final thoughts, uh, Marvo. Uh, I noticed that when I'm going through, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, I see a, a fair amount of activity by the state associations but very rarely do I see folks who like them or retweet them or comment on. And I, I've often thought, uh, well, I can like this or I can comment on this or I can retweet this to help get the word out. Because when you do that, of course, it, it increases the potential number of people that would see it. And I would think that maybe the EDs of all the state psychological associations could support each other by making sure that they click on or like or whatever uh, the posts that they see from their colleagues. Yeah, um, you know, I mentioned that I'm a passive Twitter absorber reader, and I basically just want to browse it and read it. There are a few times that I will click the little heart that says that I like it, but I, I rarely retweet. retweet. Um, 
why I, I I couldn't really tell you why I think it's that's just the way I want to be able to use Twitter right. I I tend to respond a little bit more on Facebook by doing a reply and I couldn't tell you why at this point I, that's just the way I'm 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 using Sure. But if you want your members to be able to be more active, then perhaps it's, uh, you know, whether you do a webinar on it or you do a, a, a newsletter article on the value of social media and how you can support your SPTA by being more active, that might be one way to do it. Right, right, right. Very good. Well, Margo, as I said, uh, great, great presentation again. Um, and we have noticed that there have been several people who have viewed part one uh, who missed it the first time or maybe who went back because it was so good to watch it a second time. And I'll bet we have the same thing with part two. Uh, there was a, a comment in the chat box, I mean, in the Q&A that was excellent presentation. So I echo oh, that. Oh, thank you so much. And I wonder, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? Um, you know, uh, social media is is one of those things that um, is a very, very big part of our lives. And, you know, we just need to be able to understand how we want to use it personally and professionally. Uh, and sometimes that blurs. So, you know, that uh, boards and associations need to consider as they, um, you know, really start to participate that way. I, there, I'm sure that there are state associations that are very heavy in the social media and the email and they're doing great. But those who are still trying to figure out where they need to be, uh, understand that, um, that there is a fine line that, that sometimes that blurs between professional and, and personal. And you need to keep, you would like to keep those uh, separate uh, but it is also very time consuming. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's just not something like, oh, just, just make a couple tweets or a couple posts. Um, remind your board, uh, it, it takes time. It yes. really does take time. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. We had one more, well, we had two more things come in and I promise this will be the last. The first one is in all caps, very great presentation. Thank you, Marmo. <laughs> Um, and then the, the last one is, does Marvo do training for marketing in a university setting or a setting where SPTA employees could partake? Um, I don't do training uh, in the way of social media or marketing um, in, in that regard. I do teach at a university. I, I teach a graphic design class uh, in the School of Business. So um, my graphic design comes from more of a business point of view versus, you know, design to make it look pretty. Uh, it's all about um, communicating and making sure that that design has a purpose. Uh, and then as far as um, marketing training for SPTAs, um, this is the first one. <laughs> Great, so great. Maybe there might be others in the future. That's right. That's right. Well, and, and certainly I would say because we post these webinars on the trust website, if there are staff members of SPTAs that you think uh, would be interested if the audience thinks, wow, I'd really like one of my staff members. Well, sure, you can access it. This is for the benefit of your state associations. And so if there are folks on your team that you would like to see this, then just tell them to go onto the website or you can connect with us if you have difficulty with that. We want to spread Marvo's expertise as wide as we can. So, so thank you all for joining us and thank you again, Marvo. It was great and uh, hope to see you all somehow, some way soon. Take good care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.